The film's editor, Greg Watkins. And writer, director, producer, Jordan Peele. Rusty will join us when he returns. <laughs> uh, you know, Jordan, to kind of start this off, the thing that really fascinated me about this film is that Chris plays this everyman, which we're not used to seeing in horror movies, to see an African-American male play the everyman who represents all of us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we rarely see uh, men play the protagonist of horror yeah. movies, for what it's worth. Um, yeah, this the, the the movie with oh Rusty Smith, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Rusty Smith, Smith, production designer. Good. All right, we're gonna share a mic here. Um, so yeah, the you know that was that was kind of the the, the beginning of the process was to, you know what what does a horror movie look like with a, a black male protagonist? So it was this from the very beginning was this project in representation, and um, what happened during the writing process is. You know, a lot of things became so just with that little uh, difference. You know, the biggest example, of course, is with a black male protagonist, the cop showing up at the end is a different effect than any other horror film. And so I found that that, that happened throughout the, uh, the, the, the project. Um, well, you know, the, we, we kind of step into this world and we've, uh, I've heard you talk about it before in other interviews and things like that. You've referenced some other movies that were kind of inspirational for you uh, in going into this project. Can you talk to us a little bit about those inspirations? Absolutely. And, you know, there were, there were the, these were the, the titles that with these gentlemen here we would sort of discuss and devour and uh, um, pull from with, you know, with, with, with a... Um, a, 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 a determination to not just repurpose these techniques, but to boil them down to what makes them great. And, you know, so, you know, the way we, we would talk about it would be, you know, we don't want to make a salad from our favorite influences. You want to you want to melt it down and make a soup, you know, so it's a completely different, completely new uh, uh, piece of art. But uh, we would, uh, you know, the big ones were Rosemary's Baby and the Stepford Wives. Um, we talk in, you know, s certain, certain movies I think became more valuable for uh, uh, different departments. Um, but we talked about, the, you know, especially with Rusty, we would talk about the works of, with, of, of David Lynch and Cronenberg, especially for the, the, the games room downstairs was kind of our Lynchian reference. Um, the, uh, the, the, the operating room was kind of our Cronenberg shout out. Um, we, we talked about The Shining. I mean, certainly. Well, and even in the beginning, in the, the very the very cold open of the film, you're you're taking you're talking about the uh, the, uh, the maze. Right. The, the, that's the right. The Shining, which is a piece which is a piece of ADR, by the way. It was kind of another little Easter egg put in there in post. Oh, cool. Well, because the the whole feel of the scene is straight out of. Carpenter's Halloween down this suburban street with this exactly music. exactly and uh, that you know sort of recognizing that you know the creepy uh, location that Carpenter sort of made love to in a in a horror <laughs> kind of way um, also has a completely different and scarier connotation for a black man um, especially in, in 2017. Um, and so with these references, I think especially with uh, Michael, I believe the first, one of the first pieces of our conversation about the, the film was, was basically me sending Michael all my favorite horror scores. Uh, and, we, and just us discussing what, what we liked from each one. What's a, what is a scary sound? What is a scary sound? And what is scary music? What is that, how is that defined? Yeah. 
and and you know michael you you hadn't when, when i first met michael I, you know i was like so you like scary movies he's like yeah <laughs> <laughs> and so it was uh, interesting i was like oh okay this is gonna be this is gonna be interesting i was like michael i want you to go we, we want i want you to go to your dark place and um you know he he th this was his first s score he's a very accomplished musician and and please you know you, you you know your expertise better than I do, but I you know I found him I, I found a piece of his work on uh, on YouTube, uh, a composition called Urban Legends, that sounded um, you can go find it. It just sounded like nothing I had ever heard. Um, and do yourself a favor and go look up Urban Legends on YouTube because it is extraordinary. Oh, it's nice. like in this whole different universe you have no idea what's going to go on it's that's just right crazy. <laughs> and 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 the the fact that michael was coming into this project as fresh as i am as a director i i think to me uh was what was needed to uh to pair the the visual with this new sound and so we talked about this um sound being something that is almost uncomfortable that that is really challenging to the audience and and declares to them right away you're you're in uncharted territory here and, and michael um you, so you get this collection of these horror scores and these these guilty pleasures from from jordan what's the first piece of music that you work on for the film the first piece of music i did was the one that ended up being the main title siki lisa kwawahenga which uh is Swahili for listen to your ancestor. And I wrote that piece after our, after our first lunch. And yeah, you were really clear. You said, I want the African-American voice, both literally and figuratively. And, um, and we, we had a great conversation about what is, what is scary and what sounds scary. And uh, Jordan was saying about how uh, African-American music is often very hopeful but you got to drain the hope right out of that baby. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I the way I remember is you you made the distinction that it, that it was hope because I, I the way I remember is I was saying there's there's such a uh, Afri African American music. I, I want this to sound like African American voices, but in a context we've never heard them. And the way I remember it is you said, well, yeah, African American music has hope, and uh, so you know I. I'd, I'd gladly take credit for that amazing well, observation, but but well, then, we yeah. We said, out of what we said, we kind of came up with gospel horror mm -hmm. as, as a buzzword, right? And not voodoo. It can't be voodoo. Yeah, that was the and other not thing. voodoo. So, you know, anytime as a composer when you have this, we, we have a challenge to create something that hasn't been, that's exciting, right? So, out of gospel horror, um, and we talked about how the voices needed to be, were ghosts of every victimized African-American throughout history, um, and that they were trying to inform the lead character, but they, you know, ghosts don't speak to us directly. They speak to us through shadow and metaphor and dreams. So um, I was looking for a language to have them speak, and Swahili seemed African enough, but it also seemed musical enough, because I don't think most of the slaves actually spoke Swahili, but I needed, I needed something. So I started, and of course, what would they say? Well, they'd say, get out, but that's, <laughs> that's a, you know, that literal translation wouldn't work. So I started thinking of, well, what, you know, what, what are phrases that would work? And I'd translate them, and then I'd see if they suggested musical things to me. And so out of that, I wrote the main title. And I, I did that. Um, it was at the same time that they were in production and shooting the film, so I could send it to Jordan and, and, and you know, see if that was something that he could get in his ear and that he would like. I, I had all, it imagined when I was talking about voices that it would be, you know, uh, sounds but not words. And Michael brought this piece that had words and, uh, and African words. And so in the beginning, I was very challenged by it because it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't what I was expecting. And, um, and uh, the, the, the first thing I did with that piece of music was, and we were, I was in, um, was in my hotel room it was probably a couple days into shooting and i was trying to play it over dailies to just see if i could get the vibe and the the daily that i i, I you know it was it was all kind of not working it was dialogue and i was like okay it's not where we work and i found the this uh the daily of the back plate for the green screen of the car 
going by the woods. It's like, okay, well, that's a simple one. This is kind of, uh, put that, um, put his music to that, and instantly I knew, I was like, well, that's what the titles have to be. That's creeping me the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like a lot of this stuff was in the script. Um, you know, in, in a lot of productions, a lot of stuff is discovered during production uh, that has the script, but a lot, of, a lot of the stuff we're talking about, it, Greg, can you give us a sense of what your reaction was to the script when you first read it, and did you see any significant challenges that you were going to be faced with? Well, my first reaction was, I love the script. When I got to the, to the you all seen the movie now, so I won't ruin it. Uh, <laughs> when I got to the deer hit, I stopped. I thought, oh my, this is too scary. This is super scary. I got to just recalibrate right now. And because I had no idea what the film was, it was so intriguing to me. And then I obviously, I, I read on and um, just all the different layers and so forth. And the biggest thing that struck me was, were the reveals initially. How do we handle the reveals? It's such a complex film. Um, clearly, as you said, everything had to go through Chris's point of view. Um, and those were some of the bigger conversations we had. If it didn't feel true to Chris, if it wasn't, if we weren't having, if we weren't having the audience go through his experience, it wasn't, the scene wasn't working properly. Um, but it was, it were scenes like the, the iced tea scene when there, Georgina comes in and she's pouring the iced tea. Um, the scene right after the, the dinner table scene, and then obviously the hypnosis. Those were the three in a row, first of all, they're big scenes, back to back to back. And those were the three that I, when I read it, I thought, those are going to be challenging. We have to figure out when to reveal, when to pace. And, the great thing of the dailies were, especially with the, the iced tea, um, we had the footage to do how, whatever kind of reveal we wanted in that sequence. We could have revealed Dean to be bigger or smaller, however we wanted, uh, same with Missy. Um, and then the same thing, it, it, was, it was just those choices we made of a quick look from Dean there will help set up the great look he's gonna have at the dinner table. And then Chris's experience is then gonna, gonna obviously, in, uh, and Missy's especially. Missy, we, I think we worked on hers the most in terms of just she has this really little quasi sinister smile um, mm -hmm. while while Dean and uh, Chris are talking about the, the the smoking at the at the iced tea. She has a couple of turns in the um, she plays Catherine plays it so well because when Rose starts telling the the, the story about uh, the boyfriend and whatnot, she almost plays it like the ditzy mom who doesn't quite know what's going on. She's like, uh huh, I'm interested. <laughs> Keep going. She knows exactly what's going on, and she has these great couple of turns that we found. Um, and then obviously it's set up so well hypnosis where she just controlled the sequence and controlled Chris obviously well, and one of the things that, that I personally love about this is it, the film is you spend more time on some of the shots you let it linger there you let whatever emotion is building really build instead of quick cutting which we see in almost every other horror film it's, it's a preference of mine I, I think it's harder not to cut than it is to cut um, cutting quickly is a it's a remedy for for, for lots of things, um, but it's funny, and I'll speak to the production design as well. The film, first of all, the performances were wonderful. I, I, I could stay, the camera could stay on, on Chris, especially for the hypnosis, and I do a lot of, we, we, we stayed on Chris for a lot of, um, even the off-camera dialogue from, from Catherine, from Missy, um, just because his face is so expressive, and to the idea that he is every man and we're going through this with him, but there were so many times where, especially in the, in the game room downstairs, just aesthetically, it was so much fun to just look at that room that I wanted to live in it. I wanted to get, this is his prison, this is where he is. I wanted, I was just, I was enamored of it, and I, and I you know, you kind of have to hope that what you're enamored of, the, the audience is as well. Um, I just thought everything was, was again, it was very Kubrickian, it was very right angles and so forth, um, and it was beautifully designed, and it felt like a shame to cut away from certain things. We just, we, we, it, we just had a plethora of, Great performances, great looks. Um, and it, well, it was like, very spooky to us because I'm telling you that the whole game metaphor, and this film is I think, probably more metaphors per minute in this film than I've seen in anything. And, and that deserves an applause. The, the metaphors are what really make this film more relatable, particularly to a white audience. Without the metaphors, I think a lot of audiences would be clueless about certain moments. Mm -hmm. That's that, that's I mean that's great to hear. I you know so it's the, the 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 structure or the so much of the film and and the the script was about the, this and the and every uh, the finding the tone and uh, and everybody's work was about 
you know, each character having this tightrope walk where it's it, to what, what Greg is saying, um, we have to we, we have to be mindful of where the where the audience is at, at any moment, and um, to know that the to, to put the audience in the uh, in the state of terror, you know the, the the state of not knowing what's coming, which to, is really the greatest form of horror to use in in a, a movie is to not show, to make the audience's imagination go crazy. And so part of that was, um, you know, knowing that, okay, are they, do they think Dean is the bad guy? Okay, no, Jeremy is the bad guy. What's up with Missy? Rose, you can't, you know, we had to protect Rose like she was the last Bengal tiger. Like we had to like protect that reveal. Um, but uh, yeah, so it was it was it was all a, ba a, a balancing act, and um, and, I, and the way that it that kind of starts when we arrive at the Armitage's house, mm -hmm. um, Rusty, I wanted to talk to you about this. This takes place in their apartments in New York City, right? And it's supposed to take place in upstate New York, but you filmed in Alabama. Did you guys explore uh, locations in, in other places, Rusty, or was it always going to be Alabama in for upstate New York? Or? Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, when we, we first started meeting, we first started talking, and I, I uh, because the script was uh, purposefully, the script's great and, and surprising, and then, but I was like, well, where are they? And then you told me uh, Brooklyn and upstate New York, and so I got off the plane in Alabama, and it's like, uh, <laughs> why are we here? What are we doing here? And, uh, and it, it, that was probably the, the most difficult challenge, I think, because it was my job to make that dream come true. And, the, uh, and we searched so hard for that house. And, uh, and it, we were, like, desperate. It was, like, two weeks out, and I, I was just, just kept looking and looking. And I finally said to the scout, I said, what's down that driveway? And we came down the driveway, and it's the shot in the movie. I came around the corner, and I was like, yes! You know, because I, we just had not seen anything remotely like that. That, like, uh, was isolated, like you had uh, a weird sense of place without knowing exactly where you were. And then we stumbled up, uh, upon the loft apartment, which was actually downtown Mobile. That house was actually across the bay from Mobile in, in uh, Fairhope, like, which is like uh, Pleasantville, like this weird <laughs> uh, southern retirement community. Um, but this old southern blue blood guy, like, I, I said, go knock on the door, you know, and the guy, and he, he, he let us in. And, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, it, uh, but the, the basement, we always knew, I think we felt like uh, the ending was such a special thing and we didn't think that we would ever find a house, which we never did, that had a real place in it. And uh, when I first started scouting around Mobile, uh, the location guys told me about this building. It was an abandoned school built in 1832. And they said every horror movie in Mobile, low budget stuff, shoots in this place. And I said, well, let's get in there. <laughs> you know? And I, was, I, I went through every single corner of it and I came across that room, and uh, the wood paneled room. And it happened to be adjacent to a hallway, which happened to be adjacent to an uh, IT tech room. And when I showed it to you, I think that uh, the Kubrickness of it and the whole uh, the lighting thing that was in there, that was like filthy and there were cat feces everywhere. <laughs> this is the game's room, right. But you said, that's it. That's uh, it. That was it. Well, and what, if, if correct me if I'm wrong, was, wasn't it some kind of, it had been some kind of judge's chamber or something? It was. That, that school had been so many different things. The school, I think yeah, in the right. 70s, it was some kind of conference room or somebody's office it was or something. something like that. Yeah. But that, that ceiling was there, and it was, it, it, that, it, that was the, the, you know, to, to, to be quite honest, you know, uh, if, if all of, everybody who broke their back for this film, I, I, I would say Rusty probably had the most difficult job to make this film look <laughs> like it did for $4.5 million. I mean, that's, that's extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, uh, four and a half million dollars. Is... And you don't, you don't, you don't feel that at all. You don't feel the what this movie cost, and uh, it, it was it was because of you know the the work he the, the the hard work he did finding these locations and finding these things that you know it's like if we if we had tried to build that 
that room from scratch, it would well, wouldn't have been that good. No, yeah, it wouldn't, no. it wouldn't have been that good. It would have the you know the the ceiling would have been you know expensive. But it's like we have this beautiful piece to kind of. And by the way, you know, in the in the script, I believe the 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 games room is what it's called in the script, and it's um, it, you, the, the you know the it's described what's in there that it's this sort of weird rec room, and we would you know the way Rusty and I would talk about it was that Missy had set it up to be some sort of dark emotional um, fucked up feng shui. <laughs> so that you know the somehow the there was a psychological effect that she knew if if you put this here and this here and this here and the you know the symbol of the deer here it would somehow contribute to his uh emotional and psychological entrapment um and uh so that the room you know bes besides that uh, you know the room could have had many different um, looks to it. It could have been dark, but you know, I think what what we wanted from it, and and de definitely what I wanted from it was not to go dark, dank, crusty. I you know, I don't, I, I never want to do a horror movie that's where where you're just in a basement or it's like it's a, a one of these you know, it's like a gray haunted house. I I feel like you can get that you can achieve fear, um, but not. And at the same time, give an audience a vacation, aesthetically. There's no reason to make it to even. And, and so that was important to me that when Chris is down in that space, it doesn't feel gross. It, it, it somehow still feels welcoming in this twisted way. And that's what we were, you know, what we found from the Stepford Wives and Rosemary's Baby, uh, uh, The Shining, even, is that there's an idyllic. Uh, aesthetic that can be subverted. And very creative choice of weapons of death. <laughs> Deer antler, <laughs> croquet ball. Yeah. I mean... Well, it's, it's, first of all, that to me is like, that's the stuff of horror mythology, right? If you don't have a good, you know, practical weapon, you know, found object. And, you know, our, our stuntman, Mark Vanislow, uh, our stunt coordinator, you know, what we, we would sort of discusses this idea that the action would has to feel clumsy, awkward, real. There's no, you know, Jason Bourne <laughs> shit. It's all, it's all th this uncomfortable thing. So the weapon is also a, a part of that, a little bit of a, some, some, some Stephen King influence, of course. It's a bocce ball. But um, I also wanted the, the weapons to have a, con uh, to, uh, reference the the racial social dynamic so uh things that are in some way alien or uncomfortable to the the average black man starting with myself you know this you know lacrosse and you know mount, mounted deer's heads so there's a lot of black lacrosse players don't get me wrong but um <laughs> Don't get me wrong, but I'm not one of them. And uh, you know, the 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 teacup and the the, the everything in the film was put, meant to put uh, a, a a black man myself out of my comfort zone. Well, it's, it's, um, speaking of creepiness, Jeremy, uh, when he's on the porch, he's playing the ukulele. I immediately went to Deliverance. I don't know if anybody else do that. Yeah. I mean. No, yeah, that was that. I mean, definitely, we 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 picked that reference up on on the day too. And I, you know, to be honest, I if that wasn't in the script. I think, you know, the actual Caleb Landry Jones is like closer to Jeremy in vibe than you would ever. <laughs> and so, <laughs> except he's the nicest um, and really pro he's really professional guy as well. But um, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think he was. Uh, you weren't said. I think he just kind of started playing that he, thing. He, he was his idea. He said, "I want to be playing on the ukulele on the porch." It was like weird. And he'd be, he'd be he'd be showing up on days that we, he wasn't called in, and just you'd see him in the background. Just, <laughs> bring that, bring that. Michael, for you and Greg, uh, there's this balance. Uh, actually, for all of you, but there's this balance between the horror or thriller aspects and the comedy and the love story. 
that's a tonally and rhythmically that's that's a really daunting task can the two of you talk a little bit about how you how you experimented to try to find that balance that that drew us in even more powerfully it is i mean obviously it starts with the script uh which was it, 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 it just explained it all so well but again initially to, to what jordan said about rose you have to sell her and, and Chris's relationship from the get-go, and we do. We just have those great little shots of her picking out uh, danishes in the in the coffee shop, and he's getting ready and so forth. And then you just build up that anticipation to these two, this couple meeting, and you get. And I think working on the the, the kiss at the door, it's one of the scenes we, which is a fairly simple scene. I think it's one of the scenes we worked on the most, just to sort of again sell the warmth, sell the sort of the the love, of, if you will. Uh, and then get right into the comfort they had. She's on the couch with the with uh, with Rod and I mean uh, with um, with Sid and um, he's packing and all that stuff. And um, we initially had this sort of overly emotional cue in there as well, which in a way I think we stripped back because it was working. The picture was working and so forth. I, I think it was just for me again. It was in the script. The Rod was much funnier than I mean. Rel is a genius. Um, he, he, uh, and just the way it was all, it, it, what, everything that was on screen was much better than the script. And it was the kind of thing we embraced it. It, it was just what, what this footage told me at least was don't shy away from it, embrace it, see how it plays. Don't try to force anything because that's the way it was shot and so forth. And it all seemed to just sort of fall into place. Um, I wish I could take credit for something that we did, but every performance just seemed to be spot on and the script guided it in a certain way. Um, and then obviously I'm, I always feel like no matter what we do, music is going to make the film just leaps and bounds better. We can do an amazing job, but if the music doesn't work, I think Michael beat our temp, and we loved our temp. Um, and I never once had, uh, you, you always have temp love where you just think, no one's going to beat this temp score, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. But um, I think every cue beat the temp uh, in a big way, and just again, just sort of tied it all up in a nice, neat package. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> To, uh, to answer your question, I so in the scenes with, with Lil Rel, there's no music, and there was we never, it, there was no temp there. There was never even talk. I I wouldn't have said there even if he had asked me, <laughs> because it play it's reality. I mean he that his his comedy it, it's also the reality, and so it was clear that adding music would make it seem inauthentic. So that wasn't even on the table. There was one scene. Um, about comedy, there, there was the, the garden party where uh, Chris meets all of Rose's grandparents' as friends. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, what would they be watching? I mean, what would they be listening to in that? And to me, it was like, oh, Vivaldi, you know, like the Four Seasons. So I wrote this cue that was very much like uh, Baroque music and strings and harpsichord. And, and it went with the, with, you know, it sort of flowed with the humor of the scene. And, um, and Jordan reminded me, no, it's Chris's story. We are, we're all telling this Chris's story, and Chris is not feeling lighthearted here. He's uncomfortable. And I realized, no, you know, this is not my chance to write a comedy cue. So, um, and, and I think, and when I, when I heard you, you said that at different, I heard you talking to other crafts and when I could, and I heard you using that as a, um, as a touchstone of it's Chris's story, and we're always telling Chris's story. And I, I realized, well, that, you know, as I'm not a director, I, I have no desire to be one, but to see how a director might use the, something that direct to make 100,000 choices across every craft, I think is really smart. So um, that's how I handled the comedy. And then for, the, for Chris and Rose, uh, I have a, a theme that's uh, this cello theme that's uh, mournful because, you know, you, as much as you see them, we are foreshadowing that it's just something's not gonna work out in this relationship. We don't know what it is. And I was try I, I wrote a couple things and they weren't working. So Jordan just finally said, just write, just write something. Don't write it to picture. And so it was then, of course, that I wrote the theme that they ended up using and then they would, because um, I didn't write it to picture, then they edited it into places where they felt they wanted it. And, uh, but it was, I mean, this was such a fascinating part of the process for me too to realize that um, the, way, the way this movie came together, the way I intend to continue to work, 
is to allow the, the composer to focus on the emotion, focus on the feeling, and not have to get bogged down with where everything happens. Um, because, I mean, to be to be honest, you know, as you sort of alluded to, Michael, like where everything happens is 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 something that is very is very personal um, to to me, and uh, so that that was a, a, a I think a breakthrough for us to um, and and it felt like all of a sudden we were un, unchained by the picture and. Uh, and also, you know, Greg happens to be really talented with music and music music placement as well. Um, so it was it, we we really found this process that um, you know I I honestly I have no idea how any other film gets its picture music uh, combination together. How that collaboration works it may be completely different. I, I may have haphazardly. <laughs> That fell on the way everybody does it, <laughs> you know. I don't know, but um, in my experience, this is the first time that music's ever been written wild, essentially. Um, but it worked so well. Obviously, it was it just again, you got the emotion of it, and then it worked. It fit in. We were able to cut it. We had the stems. Um, it's funny. You're always. It's always very kind of regimented. You, you want to hit certain points, and you want to get the cue to match the the length of the scene, and um, you put yourself in a little bit of a box. The great thing about this was we were out of the box. We were just completely free to get this this piece and then say, you know what, this works well here. We're hitting this motion, we're hitting this motion. We could, you know, it was malleable, we could cut it. Um, I don't think I would, not that I'm gonna have a say in it, but I would love to do it that way again. Um, it was just so free and creative. It, was great. Well, it, it sounds like the, the modest budget of four and a half million actually fueled some brilliant creative decisions. 100%. I mean, that's. That's the, you know, the, I, I think when you make a decision that nothing is going to stop you from making the movie, then the, the, only, the only way to make the movie is to recognize that every limitation, everything that gets thrown at you, which is a ton, and sometimes it's huge things, you have to welcome those things as opportunities to not only make a choice, but to make a better choice than what, where you started. So, you know, if, if you if you told me, oh, guess what, we can't, you can't look that entire direction because there's um, there's an air show going on, <laughs> you know, there and there was an air show going on in the uh, uh, ice tea scene, but um, <laughs> then you, you have to kind of figure out, well, why is that the best gift in the world? And we, let's let's only move on when we figure out how that just made the movie awesome. Well, so much in this movie is dependent upon this idyllic scene that's been set. Rusty, it was there a part of the production design or working with Leonard or Chris, your your set decorator and your art director? Was there any part of that that was really challenging that, that kind of had you guys stumped that you had to really collaborate and work around to? to find a solution? Well, the, uh, the house was actually quite small. And as scripted, uh, you know, <clears throat> we, we went back and forth a lot because it had all of the great requirements it felt like upper crust, east coast. It was, because uh, cause I can't stand like not allowing a director to look in the direction, you know, I give 360, <laughs> that's my job, you know, so that you can play, you know, and I, I, I uh, it was the first place that we saw that had all of that, but it didn't have scale. And <clears throat> we, it was about trying to figure out when he says I'm going to take the tour, as when you read the script, it was like, oh, we need a much bigger house for this tour. <laughs> and we, uh, we ended up just actually going in a little circle or <laughs> the, uh, the staircase. Um, but probably, you know, once we embraced that and the, and the house had, uh, it had all that waspy sort of, you know, characteristics, you know, built into the architecture of the house. But it was the basement, it was that hallway. We always wanted that Lynchian hallway. And Fighting for every inch of that hallway was probably the most challenging. Because, like, 
all of the graphics, you know, there was a whole backstory. They keep talking about the uh, the family and the clan, and like we figured, or you Not said, the KKK. Uh, right, 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 right. clan. But you know, but you know, but well, they were more like you know, Masonic something. Or, I mean, they were made up. Uh, it, it was they were, it really the, the the mythology. So we we called them like the uh, the Red Alchemist Society. Right. And they were supposed to be this secret society that was uh, a remnant of the Knights Templar um, and who, of course, lost the Grail thousands of years ago. And this, this procedure, the coagula, was, uh, was ultimately there you know, over, over the, all the science, through science, they were to replicate the power of the Grail, of immortality. And this coagula procedure is ultimately immortality. It, it, you know, when, when Chris gets in the car at the very end and the knight's helmet is there, that was the one thing I didn't understand. I did, where did that come from? It's, yeah, it's in the beginning. I watched the movie three times and I missed it each <laughs> Very time. dark, very dark. But when, when, when Jeremy dark, ducks him, so. he's wearing the, um, the helmet. Um, oh, yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. So you guys come to the movie with me. No, it's a good pickup. That I, I I don't expect people to pick that up. It was it was meant to be f featured more prominently, but it it was whittled down and whittled down. And um, the you know in the end you know I think it was it, it, I I like the idea of the the audience feeling that there's a bigger deeper picture, and so. Um, but yeah, it was this allusion to, you know, in, in the script, it's it's much more clear that this is there's somebody in the car with a knight's helmet, a black knight helmet, um, and it was a, an allusion to the knight's templar. Well, I want to go back to, to to something that Rusty said about the small house because you know Toby Oliver, your cinematographer, and with Greg's work as well holding on that wide shot of the house instead of doing what every other movie seems to do to go in for the close-up to introduce the parents and everything else and then at the very end you pull back and we see just the shoulder and arm of walter and we know we're in trouble yeah yeah it was you know and, i mean the, the house looks huge in in that shot it does it does and yeah i mean look it uh you know toby was a just brilliant um, cinematographer to have, especially for a first-time director. He's got a ton of experience. He's from Australia, where they don't they use dimes and nickels to make beautiful work. And uh, he's efficient. He's straight up. He's respected by his crew, and um, and he, he he's also really you know extremely capable of you know if there's. If we have an extra 20 minutes, it's like, Toby, do you see anything? Do you see anything? And he'll go find something really beautiful. You know, Greg and I, we, we you know, the, and the, to be perfectly frank, and he's told this story before, but that, that the, the story of that w long shot, is, it goes like this. It was, uh, it was the, a, a vision that I had before we even shot the, the, the movie, to, to tell it like that. I went in and on this day, we had 23 days to shoot this movie. I spent like a half a day uh, getting the shot that I wanted to use and then getting all this coverage. <laughs> and um, and, uh, and uh, because I was like, this is my first time, like what if I'm, am I, I'm, I'm gonna get into the editing bay and they're gonna go, so in, the, in your guess who's coming to dinner, you chose to not get a, any close up of the fucking parents face when they meet <laughs> you went back and so i went and this sort of insecurity and so we you know greg got and i got in there and uh he had originally cut it the way any editor should and would which is to use the coverage and he did it beautifully i mean the you know I, I, and i also have to say about greg is there was any any mistake any fault flaw any, I, I threw so much difficult, so many difficult tasks at him. You know, dinner sequences where people are improvising in different coverage. He brought me a cohesive, smooth uh, project on every level. 
um, to begin with. For and that was kind of you know of course you know the first cut and we started to you know then then he started to get you know get into my brain and see what I was you know what I was about. And by by the middle of the process, he's the he's the guy who knows the knows the film and what it needs to happen in the film and what the values of the film are um, best in the world besides me. Um, and he told me, he's like, don't, don't, don't do that. And I was like, what, don't do what? He's like, don't, if you look, like we're looking at this stuff, it's all working. You, if you know how you want to tell the story, that is special. That we don't, I don't see that, we don't, that doesn't come around very often. Um, don't waste your day with other shit. Like, and so, Greg, who's got has an amazing amount of experience, he, he taught me so many lessons, and one of them was to um, make the movie that I'm envisioning, and don't 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 try and get con contingency bullshit. Don't try and don't don't spend money to watch your ass make this movie. You know it, and so I, I'll remember that for every movie. Before we wrap up, because we're running out of time here, I just want to ask each one of you. Is there something that you take away from this experience on Get Out that you hope to take into the rest of your filmmaking career? Something you learned, some challenge you had to face, some experience, or the way you interacted with people? Rusty, how about you? Never give up, never surrender. <laughs> uh, well, it's because, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, my job to make a vision come true. And I, uh, I, I thought I was going to have a nervous breakdown because uh, uh, I, I, I was, I was afraid of failing, a lot. And uh, but uh, perseverance, you know, knowing it's got to be upstate New York. <laughs> it's got to be, you know, it's got to look a certain way. And uh, and I, I think I, I will, I will never give up. You know, finding that house was such a, a, a huge uh, hurdle because it's all about that, you know, and the whole Blumhouse formula also of like keep it in one spot and if you don't have the right spot. And we were talking about splitting it up and not being able to look at the road and these other locations. And, and, uh, and I'm really glad that I, uh, you know, just fight, fight, fight. Never give up on your dream. We're glad you fought too. <laughs> yeah. Greg, right. how about you? You know, for me, it's the thing I hope to take away from it, it was, um, I, it was such a, wonderful experience there was such respect for the process and uh respect for the film i, I just hope i have a, an experience this good later on the jordan uh as he talked about by the middle of the movie we kind of we talked about we had these mind melts where we were on the same page but he allowed me to explore um and he allowed me to realize his vision um and he had enough confidence in himself to say try something not it has to be exactly the way i want it um, and that's rare. A lot of times you're told to be a pair of hands and do it this way, do it that way. And he allowed me to explore, and I think it, it uh, allowed him to explore. And it, it's, it was just such a great relationship. And it, it wasn't a dictatorship, it was a relationship. And that's what I, uh, that's what I hope to, to, that's what I strive for the rest of my career. Michael, you will take a lot of this back to the kids you teach. And to and to compositional works that you're doing, in addition to maybe more work on films. What 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 do you take away from this that you hope will fuel your other collaborations? Well, my my students they'll they'll say good job with get out, Mr. A, and then <laughs> that'll last. I'll back, I get about five minutes worth of cred with them out of that. <laughs> then it's back to business as usual. Um, I, I think Greg really described it, I, I really felt the same situation. I felt like I was just really blessed, really blessed to be a part of this. And uh, there were times I was very stressed out, but I also really felt like I was doing something valuable. That I mean, I had no idea that the film would be so well received, mm. but I just felt like it was important work. If you do important work, I mean, you don't, it, it, you, that just gives you something that you can just shoot for no matter what happens. So um, I think that no matter what type of projects I do, I want to do work that I feel is is you know worthy of, of any of the any of the stress that it, it takes to get there. Thanks. That's good. And Jordan, you, you know, I mean, you're you're a man wears many hats, many capes. Um, what's what's this? Uh, we can only imagine what it must be like for you. But is there one thing that you kind of took away from this in your 
long career that was so unique that um, you'll hold on to it in a precious way? You know, I, I think the, the I, I had so much doubt and I, I participated myself in, in conceiving this movie. I participated in the systemic uh, notion that this movie would never get made and if it got made it would be um people would hate it and hate me and that uh and and so you know in make, making this movie was uh, or I, I should say in the writing process it was for me this idea that i can i can have my favorite movie even if it's just in my computer and in my mind and going forward, I know that if it's my favorite movie, it's going to work for other people. Couldn't say it better. Ladies and gentlemen, the filmmakers behind Get Out.